a young woman sits in a drawing room, her head bowed. She pours over the pages of a book that she cradles in her hands. The drawing room isn't opulent or wealthy, but it's tidy and neat. Patterned wallpaper, a grandfather clock ticking in the corner, a sideboard for the best china, a mirror above a heavy fireplace, a small painting. She sits, head bowed, under the hissing of the gas lamp. And as she sits, pouring over the book, words reach out from the pages, names, names of the chapters, the cattle, the winds that scatter, the smoke, the fig, night. And those words echo with truth for her and they reach up and they catch hold of her and they begin to pull her in. And that book, that book she would soon come to call the most precious book that can be bought. Well, the book was, of course, the Qur'an. And the young woman was, of course, as she was then, Frances Elizabeth Murray. How was she sitting there in her late Victorian drawing room reading the Qur'an? Well, for that we go back just a little. You see, Frances had been born into this staunchly Christian family and she had an activist heart right from the beginning. She had seen the, the trouble and the wretchedness wreaked by alcohol around her and she had campaigned and worked for these temperance meetings and even as a young woman of 19, she ran and hosted these meetings. So when she heard of a man teaching total abstinence, she was intrigued. She had to go and hear him speak. And that was how she met Mr. Abdullah Quilliam. He was giving a speech, a talk, one that we might find ourselves going to on fanatics and fanaticism. And as she sat and listened to him, she could not recognize the man he was talking about from the person she had heard about. He spoke about Prophet Muhammad, upon him be peace, and he gave an account that lit up, ignited her heart. And it was so different from this villainous, murderous man that she had heard of. And as she sat there listening to him, his words stoking these flames inside her of faith, she was astonished, astonished to hear his account. And so she waited until the, his talk was finished and she went to speak to him. And he spoke about the Prophet wasallam and Islam. And in the end, he said to her, listen, you don't have to believe me or anyone else. Here, study the matter for yourself. And he gave her his copy of the Quran in English. And so she took it home and she sat under the hissing of the gas lamp, surrounded by patterned wallpaper, the ticking of the grandfather clock in the corner. And the words that rose from those pages echoed with truth. And the names, the cattle, the fig, the winds that scatter, the night, reached out and caught hold of her heart and her soul and pulled her in. Many of us may have had a similar experience. Many of us may have read this book in translation and wondered at these names in Arabic, a language new to us but the sounds of which echoed with such truth. And so it was for Francis. And she began a journey with the Qur'an down a path she would never turn back from. So while this path of wonderment opened for her, not everyone in her house was as pleased. Her mother, truthfully, was horrified. She had a virulent hatred of what she saw her daughter doing. She tried everything she could to stop her, locked her in her room at times. But still, Frances persevered and persisted down this road that she would not turn back from. 
She began to attend meetings with Mr. Quilliam and the other Muslim convert, Mr. Hamilton. Just the two of them and she the third. And yet they met with all the gravitas of the greatest universities as they sat and read the Quran and studied it together. And so Francis became Fatima and embraced Islam. I can imagine her walking to those meetings thinking of what they would talk about, thinking of what she had read, but none of it was easy. None of those steps on that path were easy. Harassed, verbally abused, physically abused, even horse manure rubbed in her face. But when they founded that first mosque, even, she said it herself, the work was hard, but the community began to grow. And, well, the light of faith was planted and lit here in the heart of Liverpool. Still the problems carried on in the mosque. Windows were broken. Abuse still happened. And you know, as I read this and I imagined into their lives, I thought of Dar al-Arqam, that first place of gathering in Mecca, where just a few people would come afraid and, and trying to keep it secret sometimes to meet with Nabi Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam upon him be peace. And I thought of those first Sahaba, Sheikh Aisha mentioned, Bilal, Suhaib, Amr, Mus'ab, who himself was locked in his room by his mother as she tried to keep him away from Islam. He too holding on to those first few words of the Quran that he had heard from the Prophet himself sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So as hearts were planted and lit up in Liverpool, Fatima, at the heart of that, a dark and difficult chapter was about to open for her in her personal life. As she married a man she had been engaged to for a long time, Hubert Cates. He was a malign and sinister and dark presence and his hostility only grew into aggression and violence now sheikh yahya said it wasn't long before well a very difficult and violent and abusive marriage followed and reading the accounts of that are really hard to think what our sister fatima went through but she made use of one of the first pieces of legislation around divorce and was able to separate from him. I imagine her resting, healing, recovering from this traumatic time with him. And then we see something in the records that makes me smile as I think here Fatima found her freedom. She found her wings and flew. As we see that in the autumn of 92, she boarded a ship, the Anubis with two other female companions, Muslim companions, and she set off on a trip. We don't really know exactly where she went, what I wouldn't give for an afternoon and a pot of tea with Sister Fatima to talk about that. But she traveled. Maybe the ship was bound for Alexandria. I like to imagine her, perhaps like many of us, taking her first steps on African soil. The warm embrace of the air welcoming her. Welcome, Fatima. The first time she hears the adhan echoing around her, Allahu Akbar. The first time she hears the Quran recited in the mosque, recited in the streets, the first time she looks around her and sees all Muslims, mostly Muslims, rather than being in the tiny minority. And I tried to imagine what it was like for her as she met people and introduced herself. I am Fatima from Liverpool in England. She was away for seven months and we know from the Crescent, the newspaper of the Liverpool Muslim Institute, that she was welcomed home with such celebration. And after that, Fatima sort of falls off the pages of the archives. 
She wouldn't live much longer, only another seven years, dying in 1900 young from pneumonia. She left behind a child four years old, Halim. There is much speculation about that. Maybe a marriage to Abdullah Quilliam. We don't know for sure. And perhaps at this point, we give our spiritual predecessors, our spiritual ancestors, a little privacy. Not all of history has to be known, and ah, storytellers need to know that not every story needs to be told. And perhaps this one, her story, remains a little veiled, a little concealed. But one thing is for sure, Fatima Elizabeth shone. She suffered, but she also shone. And she prepared this land in Liverpool, and she prepared hearts, and she prepared the community, and she planted a garden that all of us now walk in its shelter and walk in its shade. May Allah be pleased with her and her with him.